Located on a narrow strip of land between Sleeve Foy and Carlingford Lock, the town of Carlingford is visually striking. Although its name is said to have come from an old Norse word meaning Fjord of Carlin, or, according to some, narrow sea inlet of the Hag, the town itself was not founded by the Vikings. At least, no trace of them had been found so far. According to Sullivan and Gillespie, there was a Viking presence somewhere in Carlingford Lock, and they suggest that it may have been near the town, due to the latter's Norse name. Walsh has hinted that they may have used the harbour as a temporary base. However, in the absence of archaeological or historical evidence, this must remain as conjecture. Before the Vikings, there was some Gaelic settlement in the area. St. Dararker, also called St. Moena, founded a monastic settlement at Ruski, around a kilometre from the town, while there's also a group of ring forts nearby. However, the town itself is of Norman origin. John de Courcy seems to have been the first Norman to reach the area, claiming it in 1184, later giving the Abbot of Down Patrick the rights to Carlingford Ferry. De Courcy also advanced into Ulster, building castles such as Dundrum and Carrickfergus. However, to summarise the complex politics and even more complicated feuds of the first century or so after the arrival of the Normans, John de Courcy fell foul of Richard I, King of England. This led to war between Hugh de Lacy, supported by the King, and John de Courcy, with the former winning and taking over de Courcy's land. Around 1200, de Lacy built Carlingford Castle. In the following decades, the town began to emerge. However, illustrating the complexities of the period, de Lacy and King John of England fell out. King John came to Ireland, and in 1210 de Lacy went into exile. Around this period, John is supposed to have stayed in Carlingford Castle, hence it's also known as King John's Castle a title also claimed by the castle in Limerick. Under Henry III, de Lacy returned to the king's good books and had his land and position restored to him. During the rest of the medieval period, the town grew. Much of this growth was based on trade and fishing. There were reported to be 600 English fishing boats off Carlingford at the beginning of the 16th century, with herring being the most important fish caught. It was also important as a route into Ulster, as the land route via the Moray Pass was often difficult or dangerous. Crossing Carlingford Lock or the Newry River often proved easier than the more inland route. In the 14th century, a town wall was built, as was an abbey or priory, during the 15th and 16th century, the town must have been reasonably prosperous, as some families, probably merchants, built tower houses there, such as Taft's Castle and the Mint. It is probable that there was considerable trade with Gaelic Ulster, and indeed other types of exchanges with the Gaelic world. Carlingford was an important gateway between the Pale and Gaelic Ulster. Although the English held Newry, Carrick, Fergus, and some other place in Ulster, Carlingford marked one of the northern boundaries of the extent of English rule, giving it great strategic importance. In 1505, the town was granted to the Earl of Kildare, at that stage the most powerful magnate in Ireland. He attempted to strengthen the town politically by purchasing land in Omeed from O'Hanlon, perhaps hoping to create a large pro-government area. However, the downfall of the House of Kildare ultimately weakened the town. In the Tudor and Elizabethan period, despite its continued strategic importance, Carlingford came to be somewhat eclipsed by Newry. Nicholas Bagnall, father of the infamous Henry, was granted lands in Carlingford and the other side of the lock, mostly former monastic land, as he built up his own lordship around Newry. Something his son would continue, causing anxiety in Gaelic Ulster 
and contributing to the outbreak of the Nine Years' War. This may have damaged the prosperity of Carlingford, as the rise of the Bagnalls may have reduced Gaelic trade with the town, with Newry benefiting instead. Furthermore, under Elizabeth, the Old English lost many of the privileges they had previously held, and they were gradually excluded from many high-ranking state positions, something that would affect the population of Carlingford. As might be expected, Carlingford was very important during the Nine Years' War. The main eastern land route to Ulster ran through the dreaded Moray Pass, site of two battles between Hugh O'Neill and Mountjoy. This was a difficult route and avoided if possible. It was often easier to use the longer Carlingford route instead. Supplies were also landed at Carlingford and then sent to Newry. Furthermore, a battle was fought between O'Neill and Mountjoy near the town in autumn of 1600. The defeat of Hugh O'Neill in the Nine Years' War marked a definite downturn in the fortunes of Carlingford. Many changes resulted from this defeat. The Old English loss of their previous privileged position was accelerated, while the destruction of Gaelic lordships and the expansion of English rule to the whole island saw the emergence of a new state and a new political system. The regranting of the town's charter also contributed to the decline of the town, as according to O'Sullivan and Gillespie, it created a new oligarchy that was politically acceptable to the English regime, but contributed little to the town itself. In economic terms, the new political situation resulted in easier access to Ulster, meaning that Carlingford was bypassed. Its political and strategic importance was lost, as it was no longer a gateway between the Pale and Ulster. Although the town avoided the worst excesses of the 1640s wars, the devastating impact of these conflicts on the entire country must have affected Carlingford. The town changed hands a number of times, being captured by Philemon O'Neill's forces at the beginning, recaptured by Dublin the following year, before falling to parliamentarians in 1649. However, none of these events seem to have involved the extreme violence associated with other events during this period. Nonetheless, the town must have suffered some damage. After the wars, probably, some of the traditional Old English families from the town would have been dispossessed in the Cromwellian confiscations. At the end of the century, the town suffered further damage in the war between James and William, with the Jacobites burning the town as they retreated before the Williamites. How thoroughly this was done is questionable, since the latter were still able to use the harbour as a safe anchorage for supply ships and to send sick or wounded troops to Carrick Fergus by ship. Since then, the town's fortunes have been mixed. While the 18th century was a period of decline, there were some improvements in the 19th, though Newry and Greenor seem to have done better than it. Ironically, the failure to grow massively in these centuries has proved beneficial to the town in recent decades, as the lack of development and geographical constraints meant that the town did, did not expand much beyond its old core, nor was there any large-scale urban redevelopment. This means that a considerable part of the medieval heart of the town still survives. This can be seen in Carlingford Castle, the other castles in the town, the Fossil or Town Gate, the Watch House, the Dominican Priory, and in other aspects of the town itself. We'll now look at some of these. Carlingford Castle dominates the town and the harbour. It is a large and impressive building, built to demonstrate power, as well as to defend what its Norman builders had achieved. Undoubtedly, it also had symbolic purposes, perhaps especially to impress upon the newly conquered Gaelic Irish the power of the newcomers. It is built 
and a rocky outcrop overlooking the loch, probably on the site of an older monument, perhaps a promontory fort, as the remains of a souterrain were found in a castle in 2016. Like many castles, it was built in a number of phases, lasting many years. In technical terms, the castle has a D-shaped curtain wall with a rectangular gatehouse on the west, and an internal wall running north-south. The western half of the castle is probably the earliest, predating the period of King John, possibly going back to 1200, while the east is probably from around 1262. The west part encompasses the D-shaped courtyard and its walls, also including the remains of a gate tower. Initially, it may have consisted of a straight wall facing east and an oval-shaped wall to the west. Between these walls would probably have been various wooden buildings to house soldiers, supplies and horses. There seems to have been a ditch, possibly from a rat, running around the site. This predates the castles, and the Normans may have made use of it, hence the D-shape of the wall. Later, a two-storied hall was added to the eastern part of the castle, while living quarters for the constable were added in the 1400s. The castle has been renovated recently. However, visiting is restricted at the moment to guided tours at certain hours of the day. Carlingford Castle is much larger than the other castles in the town which are more correctly called tower houses. Three of these exist, two of which are more easily identifiable as castles, the Mint and Taft's Castle. The other is the Watch House. It's better to start with this one, as most people would not identify it as a castle. Indeed, the Carlingford Heritage Centre calls it a medieval townhouse from the early 15th century. However, the National Monument Service labels it as the remnants of a late medieval fortified tower house dating to the 15th or 16th century. Though this is qualified by the statement that only the basement of the watchtower dates from this period. It was rebuilt by the Coast Guard in the 19th century. The vaulted basement and the approximately one and a half meter thick walls with what is called base batter, a wall sloping outwards at the base still survive at this castle. Nearby, round the corner really, is the ruins of another medieval or early modern house. This basically consists of a gable, but high up in this gable is a carved medieval head. It is possible that this carving may have originated in the Priory. Next is Taft's Castle. At the moment, or at least when I visit it, there is a pub in part of its ground floor. Another part has been renovated, obscuring the view. It is a nice example of a tower house, four stories high, in addition to the very top, referred to as a wall walk. It probably dates from the 16th century. Another building was added later, possibly at the end of the same century. It is probably an example of a merchant castle, a fortified house in which business would have been carried out on the ground floor with the upper floors containing the living quarters. As mentioned, part of the ground floor is now a pub. However, the other parts are not open to the public, though they seem to be connected to the same business. In my opinion, it's a pity that better use is not made of this castle. Hopefully, in the future it will. Finally, the Mint. Like the other two castles, is also close to the public. However, inside it are various information boards. Like Taft's castle, it was probably the home of a merchant family. Various explanations are given for why it's called a mint. However, the National Monument Service warns that this name probably only originated in the 19th century. It's a small tower house, just three stories high. Interestingly, there is no trace of a stone stairwell inside the building, so it's presumed there was a wooden one. 
At the top of the castle is a well-preserved wall walk with crenellations and irregularly spaced small openings in the parapets, which were used for muskets. What is probably most interesting in this castle are the ground floor windows on the front, which face the street. These have panels with ornate carvings, including a horse, a man and a bird, as well as interesting interlaced ornamentation, which may reflect a revival of older Gaelic patterns in the 15th and 16th centuries. Although it is in state ownership, it's not open to the public. There are probably good reasons for this, but hopefully one day this situation will change. In relation to the town walls, which one day surrounded an area of several hectares, these can best be seen in the Tulsa. This was one of the gates into the town. Originally three stories high, the top story was removed in the 19th century and a modern roof put there instead. Now it only has two stories. The ground floor, consisting of an archway and stairs to the first floor room, as well as a small room which was believed to be a jail cell and probably dating from the 18th century. Now it's time to turn to the Priory. The Dominican Priory in Carlingford is a little outside where the south gate to the town once stood. Though, looking at O'Sullivan and Gillespie's map of the town walls, it may have been within these walls at some point. Despite being associated with Richard de Burg, the so-called Red Earl of Ulster, it probably dates from the early 14th century and was given to the Dominican friars by some of the burgesses from the town. Like Carlingford itself, it probably thrived until the 16th century. Then it was closed down and the land granted to Nixon Bagno. However, a hundred years later there were still Dominicans in Carlingford, involved in a dispute with the Franciscans. The priory consists of a church with a nave and chancel, or choir, separated by a tower, which was probably originally a belfry. The nave is where the congregation gathered for mass and preaching, while the chancel was the space of the church reserved for the clergy and the choir. Originally, the chancel had a large window. Probably this was ornate, consisting of various lancets, types of openings, but these are all gone. It's also worth noting that the entrance to the nave has been strengthened, with crenellations and turrets been added, giving it a castle-like appearance. South of the Priory was the East Range. Little of this remains now. Originally it consisted of support buildings, such as sacristies or dormitories. Only a gable wall of this is left. Adjoining it is a newer building, possibly from the 16th centuries, which has some features of a castle. This may have been built after the friars were expelled. It's also possible that the fortification of the nave and this building occurred at the same time, producing a strongly fortified complex, essentially a castle. These are just some of the historical monuments of Carlingford. There are others to discover, and I would also recommend visiting the Carlingford Heritage Centre in the old church of the Holy Trinity. For those who love history, old buildings, or the physical remnants of previous ways of life, especially from the medieval and early modern periods, Carlingford is a wonderful place. Prevented by geography and political or economic circumstances from expanding greatly, it is still a medieval town, one in a beautiful setting between Carlingford Lock and the surrounding mountains. It is certainly worth exploring. One word of warning. This idyllic town, in the evenings, and especially at weekends, is transformed by large crowds who come here to drink. It's hard to find a place of a quiet pint, shown by the fact that there are bouncers at the doors of many pubs. Still, Carlingford is a wonderful place, one worth visiting and returning to. Mm -hmm.